and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys had a great lunch and all set up for the next talk. And I work as a security engineer, uh, as Adam mentioned before, uh, in university's, uh, university's technical security group. And I, I'm going to talk about some weird stuff that we were doing with Bro lately and some research we have done and what were the results of that research and what were the findings. So let's jump into the talk. So something about me, I'm a very big fan of Bro, and I have been working with Bro in pa for past three years as I joined university's ID team in 2015. Other responsibilities include I am, um, I, I am the architect of the SIEM solution that, uh, that university deployed, and I'm maintaining it and tuning it, fine-tuning the alerts, and we have like different IDS systems as well. Bro is one of them. We have Snowden Suricata as well running, and I maintain them, I tune them. Uh, and those are my responsibilities, basically, uh, apart from threat hunting and incident handling at university's team. Uh, and I am a part-time PhD student as well, and my research areas are cybersecurity uh, related. So what we are going to talk about today is, uh, of course, the weird log file. Uh, what is weird exactly in Bro? What, is, uh, it, what Bro defines as weird? The motivation for this talk, uh, the motivation of why we wanted to look more into the weird log file that Bro generates, the types of weirds that are there, that are there right now uh, defined in Bro, where you can find them, because one of the uh, things that I started looking was, OK, there was a log file, and I know the weirds that are defined in the log file, but where I can find them, like if I want to see the condition that triggered that alert or that triggered that weird in the log file, so exactly, um, so that would tell you that if you want to look for, an, look for a weird that is triggered in your network, uh, that topic of where to find weirds will tell you exactly where you can find them in bro code or where is it written exactly. Uh, and then we will be deep diving into some of the most triggered, uh, uh, most triggered weirds in our weird.log file at university and what we found out and what was the remediation or what we exactly did with it. Did with it. And then I will close up with my, um, with, our, uh, with my summary of what exactly was the weird research and uh, what was the university's profile looked like before and after the research of the weird log files. So what is weird in Bro? So if you, as the name suggests, if you Google the word weird, it is exactly uh, something which is unusual. Or in the Google land, it, I can say that it's something uncanny. That's the very first definition that comes up when you Google the word weird. Uh, but in Bro land, weird is something that actually is unusual traffic, or something malformed, or something that is not complying with the TCP IP stack, or the RFC documentation. Like there are a lot of times the, uh, when the analyzers were written, there were some uh, uh, restrictions in RFCs that this flag has to be this, this size has to be that. So those were uh, considered, uh, those were considered when some of the weirds were defined in the code. So if you're looking into the weird file, so exactly uh, in Bro, weird is the activity that is not something that is complying with the natural flow of traffic. It can be either attacker spoofing the traffic, there are malformed packets, it can be your malformed or misconfigured application somewhere running on your network. So there's a lot of things that can be inferred from the weird log file in Bro. Motivation. So, uh, as a security engineer, we always want to look for something that is unusual, right? Because that's part of our job, that we do not want to look for something that is usual and that is normal, which is great. Like, everything is working fine, perfectly fine. But if you want to look, uh, look into something different or something that is not usual or complying with traffic, you might want to take a look at your weird.log file. And that was my motivation, uh, that uh, when, I was seeing the, when I was seeing different log files that were defined in Bro, weird was one of them that was growing in size pretty heavily, and I would wonder why. Like, is it our, is it our uh, architecture, or is it our university's network that is triggering so many, other, so many alerts? And if it, if it is that, then what exactly is causing those alerts? Is that it's a malform application, or misconfiguration somewhere? So I just wanted to find out what exactly was going on. Or it can be an attack which is going on, and we are just completely blind of it. Bro is reporting it, but we are not just seeing it. So it can be anything, right? So that was a curiosity. And we had like more than 200 types of different weird uh, logs, logged in our weird.log file. And in your day-to-day -day activity, you never realize that some of the activity you just do not, you just skip through it, might be there in weird.log file. And it can be actually very intuitive to tell you what exactly is going on your, on, on your network. So that was the motivation for uh, starting the uh, research of weird.log file at university. Before going into that, uh, 
a brief talk about what exactly the network traffic looks like. We have 10 GBPS network links that, that, um, that we monitor with our IDS systems. We have Gigamon in place. Uh, which has uh, the capability of uh, trans uh, of mirroring traffic to dis uh, mirroring and forwarding the traffic to different IDS systems. We have four bro sensors that are behind Gigamon, and each one is getting like 25% of overall traffic, which is uh, which is 25% of 10 Gbps peak. We have 8 Gbps of peak at uh, the peak peak hours of university, but it averages out at around 5 Gbps, so it's not very heavy. Uh, we have uh, overall so. Each sensor would be getting uh, almost. It is very. It is not very. Uh, it was not recorded on a very busy day, so it was like one of these summer sessions going on. And I just, uh, I just sat and I just looked into that. What exactly the PPS or a PPS was for a sensor? So it's almost 300,000 packets per second that one sensor, each sensor uh, gets uh, in the traffic. And coming back to the weird, because that's the focus of the talk. Weird dot log. We usually get 21 million uh, weird notices logged per day. And this is excluding some of the very noisy weirds that we have already disabled, and we just uh, I will talk about it later in the talk. But that was the approximate count of our uh, weird.log file for, for a day. Types of weirds. So as I have mentioned before, that there are many types of weird defined in Bro. These are the top 20-ish weirds that I have found in my weird.log file. Uh, and as the... Um, and, and as and some of and as you can see the weird names they are pretty descriptive so if you are seeing those in your weird.log file you can kind of like infer what's going on so uh, basically yeah you can just get an idea of okay these are the weird types that are getting uh, noticed in your weird.log file and then you can go from there that why exactly they are triggering so these are like top uh, top 20 weirds that we see in our network every now and then excluding some of the weirds that we have already disabled so i will come to that in the couple of slides. We have to find weirds. Um, so as I mentioned before, that when you are looking into the weird log file, you might come across a weird type, and you want to know that where exactly it is defined. Because uh, if, you want to, if, if, you want to, if you want to figure out whether it's a false positive or true positive, you might want to take a look at what the condition that is triggering the weird and whether that condition is satisfied by the network traffic that I'm seeing or the sensor is seeing. So I, I was curious to know ex where exactly the weirds are defined. So the definition of the weirds uh, is majority in uh, .cc file. So Bro has uh, the source code of Bro. So if you have compiled Bro with source code, you have source code lying somewhere in your, on your sensor. So you can go into the, you can just grab through the source code with that. Uh, I know that's a very uh, rough way of doing it, but you can just grab through your source code files with that weird name, and you might you might find the exact analyzer where exactly that weird is defined to see the condition that what condition is triggering the, that weird in your network. Uh, other than that, there are a couple of weirds that are defined in the policy and base folders. Not there are not very many though, but there are a couple of weirds that I found that were defined in the dot bro scripts inside uh, residing on the base and policy folders. So that's where exactly you can find the weird that is triggering in your network. Uh, logging, and there is, a, there is another thing. So when a weird is triggered, uh, Bro logs it. So where exactly Bro logs it, of course, it's, it, logs, it logs it in log, weird.log file. Where it resides, it resides in the normal logging folder. So if you have a logging folder where you have different protocol logging enabled, and if you, if you are seeing weird.log file, that's where exactly it would reside, unless you have changed the configuration of logging somewhere else. Um, there's another very important or cool script, which is uh, weird.bro. It resides in the base frameworks notice uh, folder. What it does is it has the capability. So it has the capability of uh, ignoring some of the alerts or thresholding some of the weirds that are triggered in bro. So for very noisy weirds, which we do not want to see in our network, you do not have to uh, d disable them in source code. But rather, you can just ignore uh, you can just say that action is ignored for this weird in that log file. So you can actually get rid of some of the very noisy weirds triggering in your log file by just going through that uh, file weird.bro and defining it there that just do not log it. So those are the places where exactly you can find uh, data re regarding the weirds in, in Bro. Now, deep diving into what the weird log file looks like in university. So the, the analysis of this, these were the five uh, top most triggered weirds in university network. That's over a period of uh, 24 hours. So the, I just uh, wrote the command that I used to get the top five um, 
it was more the list but i just i just showed the top 5 because those those are the ones that actually we worked on to get rid of so the first column is the count of that weird notice and the second column is the weird type that was logged it's the second column is exactly the seventh column in your weird.log file so dns rr unknown type was the topmost that was hitting um, hitting the log files possible split routing was another one inappropriate fin was another one a fragment we don't fragment then bad icmp checksum we will go through each each and every one of them and uh, and see what exactly was causing them to trigger and what was the remediation we did for each of them so the very first one is dns rr unknown type so where is it exactly defined it is defined in the source code so if you go through the uh, source slash analyzer protocol if you go through the protocol analyzer dns and then go through the dns.cc file you can actually see the condition which triggers uh, dns rr unknown type to get logged in weird.log basically the cause is like the the cause is very simple that there are some weird uh, there are some resource records in dns that are already parsed in bro but there are some that are currently not parsed in bro so that is a catch all condition that if if bro encounters a research uh, if bro encounters a resource type that is currently not parsed in the list of the resource record that are currently parsed then it will just catch that and then it will just log it in weird saying that this is not currently parsed in bro and then the and then the uh, type seen in the network that is the data from the weird.log file the first column shows the count the second column of course is the uh, weird type and the third column is the type that was not uh, that was not parsed currently in bro so you can see the the types were like 46 was the topmost 50 43 47 48 and a quick google search revealed that those are the types that actually belong to dnssec protocol so dnssec protocol introduced some new types uh, some new rr types in dns protocol uh, 46 46 belong to rrsec which is the resource resource record signature that's the actual digital signature that is provided by the zone for the uh, authentication that uh, that 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 actually saves for from dns spoofing so it kind of like uh, a digital digital signature for the zone 50 is nsec3 uh, that is related to the 47 47 is nsec which is next secure so if there is a non existent domain then the next secure will give the next secure record available and available and all the types uh, available for that next secure record and since because of that it, it was causing the zone walking problem so it would leak out information which is like unintentional so that's why they came up with nsec3 which was type 50 that reduced that zone walking problem that eliminated that zone walking problem so those were like related the type 50 and type 47 type 43 is delegation signer it is for subdomains and sub sub uh, subdomains in the tree for the uh, signing uh, for the digital signature 48 48 is dns key dns key exactly uh, is the record that holds two two type of keys one is the uh, public key for the key signing key and the second one is the zone signing key so these are the basic top 5 uh, and the last two were not very uh, noisy but i still mentioned that t key and any we were getting some of the alerts for those two but the starting five those five were the uh, highest uh, triggered alerts in our uh, in our weird.log for the dns rr unknown types so now we knew that okay so these are the types that are not parsed by bro currently so the reason was as our dns sub servers support dnssec we were getting ton of traffic for the dnssec protocol because the clients will uh, clients will say i am compliant i am supportive of dns uh, dnssec queries and response and the server will also say that i am also supportive and i have the records for you so the reason for the dns rr unknown type getting triggered in our weird weird log file was our dns servers compliant of dnssec queries and responses so the remediation it's pretty straightforward either you can ignore those alerts by going into the weird.bro file and just say i do not want them to log anymore or you can write the dnssec parsing in bro for those five types and uh, after going through the code actually we chose the later so we thought that why not to just write something up because it's useful information out there right like if your dns servers are seeing 90% of your traffic the 90% of the traffic to your dns servers is dns sec traffic then why not to just implement something that actually parses that traffic and gives you a pretty log file so we actually chose to write the dns sec rr type parsing so that dns sec rr type parsing is just for the five top uh, rr rr types that we have discussed before in the before slide and the result was we compiled the code with dns sec rr typing support rr types parsing support and then the all of a sudden after we compiled that code and ran that code the the count of dns rr unknown type reduced tremendously from like 2 million to this just couple of thousands a day 
So, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so that was the result. So that's how we got rid of DNS RR unknown type. So if you want to give it a try, uh, the code is available at two places. One was it got recently merged in the dev branch of 2.7. So you can get the that code and compile it and see if it's working in your environment. Or I, I actually forked the 2.5.4 branch from, uh, from GitHub, and then I added those changes of DNSSEC parsing in that code. So there is like two branches uh, out there. You can try any one of them if you want to, if you want to uh, give it a try for DNSSEC parsing in your environment if your servers are DNSSEC compliant. That was interesting. So that's the second uh, topmost triggered uh, weird, which is possible split routing. It's defined, again, in the analyzer, TCP uh, protocol analyzer, tcp.cz. You can just go in the source code and just search for what possible split routing, and it will come up with the code which has condition that triggers that. But usually the cause of split routing is when bro is not able to see the one part of the connection. So if bro is able to see the, the so connection has two parts, right? Client to server, server to client. So if, if bro is just seeing the client to server connection and not able to see the another side of the connection, then it raises the, it raises the condition that possibly it's a cause of possible split routing because I'm not able to see the other way of traffic. It's good to have that uh, alert in your weird.log file if you actually have possible, if you actually have split routing, because then you can safely ignore it and you know move on. But it's not good when you do not have possible split routing, and you actually are getting that split routing um, in the weird.log file. And we in university, our traffic is not uh, like bro sees everything. We do not. We have symmetric architecture. We do not have split routing in our environment. So I was curious to know that why exactly it is the top most triggered, one of the top most triggered alert. Um, so in seen in the traffic. So I was, uh, I was able to grab the top most destination for which the split routing was uh, uh, triggering. The first column is the count. The second column is the destination IP. Destination, third column is destination port. And the fourth column is the weird uh, type. So I noticed a thing. I noticed that, and you can also see that it was triggering for a web server which is listening on port 80. So I thought that, oh, maybe somebody's trying to attack our web server, and bro, it, is, it is completely evading bro, because that's the first thing comes into your mind as a security engineer, that, OK, we are having an attack. So um, it was interesting. So when I looked that IP up in our database, it was actually for a Lug server. Lug is Linux user group. We have a Lug, pretty big Lug group in university, and they have like set up servers that mirrors some Linux packages, and people just, uh, they, it, people just uh, downloads those packages from those servers. So that server was having some issue. And I was like, OK, it's either the application is not behaving properly or there's some kind, of, some kind of network configuration. Like, why that server is triggering possible split routing? So I was like very curious and interested to know. We don't own that server, so we, we had no chance of getting a PCAP from the server to see exactly what traffic is getting hit to the server. <coughs> but we did have the. Uh, PCAP from the bro servers, uh, bro servers, and then the firewall. And when I saw firewall PCAPs, it was like complete connection. Like the clients were seeing, see, uh, the clients were sending SYN, the server was sending SYNAC, like the proper connection, SYN, SYNAC, AG, the data was transferring, the application was, the application was, application was detected as YUM by firewall. On firewall world, it was perfectly fine. But when I saw the bro PCAP, bro just see, bro just saw one connection, like, it just saw sad, like sin, ack, and data from the client, and nothing from the server. And I was like, maybe bro is dropping packets from the server to client. And I was like, why would just bro selectively drop that package? So I was like very interested to know, and I was discussing this with my manager, and I was like, I don't know what's going on, and I cannot figure out what's going on. So he said like, OK, we are getting that traffic from Gigamon, so maybe Gigamon is filtering something. So we looked into the Gigamon configuration, everything was fine, and then we were still confused at what's, what's going on with the uh, possible split routing with that server. And then it turned out that when we were talking to one of our network engineers, he said, oh, you know what, let me check the ACL of the router. And then I was like, OK. And then the reason for that was that since the Lux server is very noisy or very busy, what network engineers did was we collect NetFlow from routers. And it would overwhelm our NetFlow on, a, on very busy days for the routers, or for that server. So what our network engineers did to get rid of it was uh, they implemented a filter. They implemented a filter of filtering one side of the connection. Like they would not log anything from the server, but they would just log, they would just forward all the logs from the router to the NetFlow and other uh, logging, log, logging engines. Just the requests from the client. So, and I was like, oh, now that makes perfect sense because the router ACLs are messing things up. And I was like, 
who in the world does that? Like, what would you get out of it? Like, just one side of the connection? Like, you would just see one side of the connection? And then I was like, I was debating that there is no point confusing our poor idea systems by assuming that, oh, I'm blind to the other side of the connection and I don't know what's going on. So actually, we remediated. We, we talked to them and I was like, there's no point to just collect the requests and drop all the responses. So we actually talked to them and we actually fixed the router ACLs for, uh, for dropping both the sides of the connection. So we no more log that uh, because of the noisiness or busyness of that server. And the result was uh, possible split routing tremendously got reduced for that server. And then there were not very many, uh, like it, it got reduced and there were not very many alerts for that server anymore. So that was the story behind possible split routing. And it took a while to figure that out. Like when you do not have any clue what's going on, you just do PCAPs and you just stare at them. And I was just, I don't know. I actually did the sequence number as well. Like maybe there is some sequence number attack that you know some packets are getting skipped by Bro Engine because the sequence sequence numbers doesn't match. But yeah, that was crazy finding. So, but yeah, some some things. There is always something stupid that is behind something that you think that oh my god, it's an attack. That was it. Uh, inappropriate fin, that was the third most top triggered uh, weird in our log files. Again, you can find it in TCP, uh, TCP.cc. I will not uh, spend a whole lot of time on that, but inappropriate fin is caused because of uh, when Bro sees a fin packet set on a, set on a packet which was not, uh, which, which is not compliant with the traffic, like you would not see all of a sudden a fin or a tear down of a connection. So that's how uh, inappropriate fin would get logged. Uh, the condition is defined in the code, and if you want to go through the code and see what exact condition is, you can see. But the basic crux of the inappropriate fin is the, the cause that the packet is set with a fin, fin flag, and Bro is not expecting that, or it should not be expected in the normal TCPIP communication. Uh, seen in the traffic, again, the same server had exact same problem, uh, inappropriate fin, and it was almost 1.4 million times. So we actually knew the, knew the cause, that it was because of the split routing. So it was kind of like a consequence of possible split routing. So when we got rid of possible split routing by uh, applying the router ACS, we automatically got rid of inappropriate fin as well. So you, know, you might see that if you can get rid of one weird, other weirds are the like consequences of some in misconfiguration. So if you fix one configuration, then it would it might just mitigate other remaining consequent uh, triggered alerts as well. So that was uh, a consequence of possible split routing, and we do not see it anymore after fixing our router ACLs. Fragment with don't fragment. That one is very interesting, as the name suggests. Basically, it is defined in the source fragment.cc. Um, it's caused because uh, there's a flag called don't fragment. It's defined in the IP header. And the purpose of don't fragment is, as it says, that do not, do not fragment the packet if the don't fragment is set and if it does not comply with the, or it is bigger than the MTU of the current interface. And that is basically because for, basically for the routers to drop the traffic and, uh, and give back an ICMP packet to the source saying that the maximum MTU exceeded of the packet, reduce the size, and reduce the Basically, it is for avoiding fragmentation and PMTU discovery. That flag is used. Seen in the traffic. So the first column is the uh, count of uh, how many times we got it in a day. The second column was the IP address. And the third column was the uh, type. I noticed a very interesting thing that when I was doing the fragment with don't fragment, the top two IP addresses that triggered that were our DNS servers again. And I was like, oh my god, there is something up with our DNS server somewhere. So um, yeah, so, the, so, so there is a story behind it. So our DNS servers were, why they, so, so that's, that's not like complying, like fragment with don't fragment. You should not get a fragment with the don't fragment bits set. And that's perfectly valid, because if fragmentation is happening, that means either router is not verifying the flag, or either the router is verifying the flag, but still doing fragmentation. So like, what's going on, right? So that's a very interesting thing to look at, that why exactly was, what exactly was happening, because that's not how routers are supposed to work. It's turned, it turns out again that it's the eDNS and DNSSEC that are, who are culprits for fragment with don't fragment. So eDNS is basically extensible, it's not extens extensible DNS, it's the extensions for the mechanism, extension mechanisms for DNS version zero, that is introduced in the RFC uh, for eDNS because, uh, because of DNSSEC. Bec uh, since, the RFC, since the conventional RFC of DNS says that the maximum payload of UDP, maximum UDP payload of a DNS packet should not exceed 512 bytes, 
to accommodate for the additional records and the additional information that DNSSEC provides, it has to be larger than that. So eDNS is the one that provides that um, in the RFC that, okay, if the clients and servers both are compliant with DNSSEC, you, you add a record called opt at the end of the additional record, and then that would just advertise to the server. If it's client, it would adver advertise the, to the server that I am DNSSEC compliant, and I can accept the DNSSEC uh, responses. And on the server side, server would adver advertise exact same thing to the client that I am, uh, I am capable of uh, responding back, back with the DNSSEC responses. So the problem was uh, of a DNSSEC uh, and, and how, how DNS handles that is it's an application layer. So DNS pushed the, uh, push the uh, approach of dealing with the maximum MTU or the payload size in the application. So what DNS would assume is, okay, my default configuration is, uh, there is a bind line configuration where it is uh, defined that the maximum UTB payload size for a packet is 4096 if the DNSSEC if the servers are DNSSEC compliant. So application would assume that I have to work with the, uh, I have like the leeway of 4096 bytes, so whatever my response is, I'm just going to bundle it together in one packet, as long as it's not exceeding 4000 bytes, and I'll just push it on the interface, and I would assume that the normal fragmentation is working, and I'm, I will set the don't fragment flag bit, because then I would know the PMTU discovery, like I would know the, uh, the minimum or the maximum MTU, and then I would work along that. So that was the basic problem, that our local interface would not support 4,000 bytes of MTU. Our local interface was 1,500 bytes. So as soon as the application pushes the packets on the NIC, it would fragment it because it would not be able to travel that local interface unless it would fragment it. So the fragmentation was happening on the local interface with the don't fragment bit set by the application. So that was the main reason that, uh, that our local interface, was, local interface was not able to support the maximum uh, maximum MTU that was set by bind in the application. And the remediation, remediation was like we, we could either have increased our local MTU from 1500 bytes to um, 4096 bytes, or what we could have done that um, we could have tried to tweak the configuration setting in bind nine. There is actually a configuration that can say that you can set and you can set and say that the payload should not in a packet payload should not exceed 1472 bytes. And we chose the second one because you might never know if you have, if you have changed your local interface MTU, it might get fragmented in other parts of the network. So we chose the second one and uh, we had to remember that application PMTU discovery is hap will happen if the ICMP is not blocked at the border. So if you are blocking the incoming ICMP, fragmentation will have to have happened because your DNS server would never realize what exactly the maximum MTU is because it is waiting, it is setting down fragment, it is waiting for the response whenever the packet will get dropped by the router and the router would, router would say that, hey, this packet is dropped, right? So you have to make sure that the ICMP is not blocked at the border if you want your DNS server to know about maximum MTU. So remediation continued. Uh, there is a, a quick thing, there is a setting called maximum UDP size that's in the binding configuration file. You can go and check and see uh, what the default value is. But it is def by default, it is set to 4,096 bytes. We have set, to, we have, uh, set it to uh, 1,472 right now to, to reduce the fragmentation or to avoid the fragmentation. And once we set it, like not we, we, we asked our DNS uh, admins and told them that, hey, this is happening on our network. The local interface is fragmented the packets. and. Uh, you know, the routers are just normally working fine because for routers, 1472 or 1500 bytes is the maximum MTU and they would not even bother to look into the drone fragment flag because they are not fragmenting it. So, and then they, uh, then they set that size to uh, 1472 and as soon as they set it, we no more uh, got any fragment with drone fragment notices, notices anymore in our weird.log file. So it tremendously dropped for our DNS servers from like 700,000 700, to just a couple hundreds a day for that fragment with don't fragment um, weird, dot, weird log, weird log uh, type. A few other weirds to notice. Um, there are two other uh, weirds that are not very noisy and we have not got rid, rid of them. One is bad ICMP checksum and the second one is TCP uh, Christmas. We see them often and I have realized that the reason for that is scanners. Like all I have uh, researched is like the IPs that are scanning us. TCP Christmas is uh, defined in TCP.cc protocol analyzer. ICMP bad checksum is defined in ICMP.cc. And as, as the name suggests, ICMP, I, bad ICMP checksum is for the packets that do not have good, good checksum. And then TCP Christmas is when all the, all the bits of TCP 13 flag are set. 
just like lighting up the Christmas tree. And uh, that is usually done by the, uh, by the scanners. And there's actually a, actually a scan called TCP Christmas scan. So if people are scanning your network, you might get the TCP Christmas as triggered one of the, one of the weirds in weird.log file. We blocked the scanner IPs. We do not get rid of them. Uh, we do not get rid of th those weirds in our weird.log file. We want to actually know when they are triggered so, so that we can block the IPs. And we have blocked the IPs, but we were very careful in blocking the bad ICMP checksum IPs because a lot of time what happens is if your uh, network guys are uh, troubleshooting your network from a remote location, they would do a trace route. And a lot of time happens that the bits get flipped in, uh, bits get flipped in the network communication because of noise. And uh, some packets might end up with a bad ICMP checksum, and you might be blocking some legit people doing troubleshooting of your network. And that has happened to us in the past. So we have now a threshold that if we see 10, 10 bad ICMP checksum packets from a given IP for a short period of time, then we block that IP. We do not block for a couple of bad ICMP checksums, checksums from a couple of bad IPs. Not bad IPs, couple of couple of IPs. So um, those were the few other uh, weirds. Summary of uh, weird files. So those were the weirds we worked on, and I kept saying that we, uh, we avoid logging off very noisy weirds, so that's the last one. DNS unmatched message and reply, we were getting like almost more than 11 million per day, but that was a rough number of average. So we were getting like a lot of them, so we just tried to ignore them, and they do not tell you a very good reason or a story, because a lot of times DNS is an unreliable protocol, it runs on UDP, so a lot of time a, a client sends a request and waits for a response, and if it doesn't get a response, it sends the request back again. So then there's a mismatch between, okay, DNS, uh, okay, bro analyzer saw two requests, but no response. So these are the, uh, these are get logged as DNS unmatched messenger reply, and it's not very intuitive, and you do not get whole lot of out, whole lot out of a whole lot out of it. So you just, we just ignore it and we do not log it. Um, for the first five, we have done some improvement in our network, and we do not get them anymore. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, for DNS RR unknown type, we have implemented DNS RR parsing, possible split routing, and inappropriate pin. We fixed our router ACS, thank God. Uh, we did that, and then um, fragment, we don't fragment, we fix our bind configuration. So those were the improvements that we were blind to, and kind of like we were not even looking at it, because 90% of our DNS traffic was fragmented. And since we block ICMP, our DNS would never know about, okay, what is the, what's the maximum MTU I should pack my packets into to, dis to uh, deploy on our network. So it would like degrade your performance, right? If you're going through a DOS attack, that would be a severe impact, because if you are like working in normal environment, you might not notice it, but still, it's a performance hit, right? If the if there is like 90% of your DNS traffic is hit by fragmentation, so that was a really good find uh, for us. The bind configuration, TCP bad TCP and uh, bad ICMP checksum and TCP Christmas, we blocked them, and yeah, we just ignored the DNS unmatched message reply. By doing this, the, these uh, improvements in our network, we almost got like 85% rid of our traffic logged in via dot log file. So yeah, by improvements, we got rid of like almost 18 million per day via notices. We were overall getting 21 million, but now we have just got rid of like 85% of our traffic. Universities profile before. So it's not very uh, visible because it had the, the graph has plotted like 3.8 million points. And the y-axis is actually the weird type. Uh, as you can see, like zero, zero, zero signifies DNS are unknown type, the one, one signifies fragment, we don't fragment. The XX is the epoch time, so it's a one day worth logs we are getting. So that's why it's very noisy. The two sections I have highlighted, the, the first section at the bottom is the top 10 weirds that are even, even listed in the column. So you can see that it happens every time. So you cannot see a pattern, right? So if you are like, if you get rid of those uh, noisy weirds, you can actually see the patterns in the weirds. So if some activity which is bad and it is happening quite often time, and it is kind of like a beaconing, then if you just plot it on a graph, you might see it in a pattern, right? So the top, bra the top uh, bar that I have highlighted, it's kind of the weirds that are not very, that are not triggered very often, but you should work, it's worth, it's worth looking, right? That why exactly it is happening like once a day or two or twice a day. So those were the two uh, uh, activities that I wanted to highlight, that if you want to see any kind of misconfiguration, you might want to target the uh, top 10 uh, triggered weirds, but if you want to find something malicious or bad on an attack, you might want to target the ones that are very rare in your network, and you just see once or twice a day. Again, after that's not very visible. Again, it's, it, it is plotting 700 points. I should have done a better job in graphing it, but still, uh, we got like rid of almost 85%. But it's not visible. It's okay. 
the, the X is epoch and the Y is, again, the notices. You can see the, the count of the notices. It's just like a couple of hundred thousands. Not 100,000, a couple of thousand counts now. And the rare ones that I have uh, that I have highlighted at the top, you can see the TCP Christmas. It happened like six times in a day. Uh, there was an SSH unknown key exchange algorithm that happened twice a day. So that means there might be servers sitting in our, sitting in our network that are actually using very old or deprecated key exchange algorithms. So we should just, according to the policy, we should just go and see why they are using that because it's not secure, right? So if you target the rarest ones, then you might find something in your network that is not security, like security wise that is not very highly protected. But if you, if you target the uh, top, top triggered, you might just end up improving your network in, com in terms of configuration of misconfigured applications or malformed something or some configuration in the uh, configuration files of the applications, et cetera. So that's it, uh, right on time. I want, to, I want to thank to Bro community. They have great community out there at Bro mailing list. When I started uh, as a fresh Bro user, I had a lot of questions. I had stupid questions, stupid questions part one, stupid questions part two. So they all were like very stupid, but they actually supported and they actually provided answers and solutions. Uh, and I really appreciate their time in uh, support. Uh, in support of the Bro mailing list. So yeah, absolutely try it if you are a new user or if you are a really excellent user. Whatever stage you are in, in your Bro using, you, should, you just add to the mailing list and if you can provide some answers to the questions or if you want to ask the questions, you can feel free to ask the questions and there's a, there's a great Bro community out there who answers the questions very efficiently. Uh, and then I would like to thank uh, to be a part of Bro, BroCon this year and be a part of presenting team and um, getting an opportunity to present this year again the work we have done with, with weird.log files. So, any questions? Yeah. So you block ICMP packets with bad checksums and TCP IPs that... You block the source IPs that send you several bad uh, ICMP checksums and TCP Christmas uh, right. attacks. Right. Since packets can be easily spoofed, you're kind of putting yourself uh, right. in a denial of service situation. It's kind of like uh, the scan detection scripts we have, where they, uh, TCP Christmas is just a scan. And if you're right that IPs can be easily spoofed, but then you have to have a trade off, right? Like if you want to block them or if you want to just allow them. And, and we do not block them like forever. So we have like some scripts that if they see that IP for, for the first time, it gets blocked for like 15 minutes. In next, after 15 minutes, if, it, if, if, the, if the script sees the IP again, it gets blocked for one hour. And if it keeps seeing the IP after the block, times end, uh, block time is end, it keeps getting blocked for the longer period of time. So that's what we do. Um, and yeah, we have, we have encountered uh, really good false positives in the past where we have blocked Google's SPF IPs and people were mad at us that, oh, you're blocking the half of the emails, people are not getting, people are not getting emails, but well, that's the, that's the, you have to just take it with a pinch of salt. So you have to take the heat sometimes. Any other questions? <laughs>